Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a cherry margarita. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a lemon drop. And on today's episode, we're discussing the strip search phone call scam that took place largely at fast food restaurants in the United States. Starting in 1994, over 70 phone calls were made to fast food restaurants, grocery stores, and video rental stores in 30 different states, particularly in more rural areas. According to the Courier Journal, these were, quote, areas where managers were more likely to be trusting, end quote. During each call, a male caller who identified himself as a police officer or other authority figure, would contact a manager or supervisor and would solicit their help in detaining an employee or occasionally a customer who was suspected of a crime like theft or drug possession. The caller would then provide a generic description of the suspect, usually a young female employee, although a handful of victims were men or older adults, which the manager would recognize. The caller would then ask the manager to search the suspected person. The tasks would initially start as strip searches before gradually becoming more invasive and sexual in nature as the quote-unquote investigation continued. Eventually, the caller would have groomed the manager to the point where they would do almost any Anything asked by them, such as spanking, kissing, inappropriate touching, oral sex, and even sexual assault and rape. Many of the incidents would last hours before either the participants of the strip search realized the call was a hoax or by the intervention of a bystander. The caller was described as calm yet authoritative and used police language to help fool his victims. He researched the names of regional managers and local police officers in advance and mentioned them by name to bolster his credibility. Here are a few examples of the hoax in action. On December 16, 1999, in Blackfoot, Idaho, a 16-year-old girl working at a local pizza parlor was taken to the manager's office after a phone call made by an individual only identifying as quote-unquote Officer Davis for the Blackfoot Police Department, accused an employee of stealing a woman's purse with a $50 bill in it that night. The caller convinced the manager to strip search the employee and to provide detailed descriptions of her naked body, including her breasts and genitalia. The incident ended when a 22-year-old male colleague of the victim came into the room and intervened with the male employee confronting the officer on the phone before the caller hung up. Less than a year later, on November 30th, 2000, a female McDonald's manager in Lichtfield, Kentucky, undressed herself in the presence of a customer. The caller had convinced her that the customer was a quote-unquote suspected sex offender and that the manager serving as bait would enable undercover police officers to arrest him. When asked why she didn't call the police, she said she thought she was on the phone with them. In February 2003, at a McDonald's in Hinsville, Georgia, a caller convinced a 55-year-old janitor to do a cavity search of a 19-year-old cashier for quote-unquote hidden drugs. The Louisville Courier-Journal reported that although there were dozens of calls across different states, law enforcement agencies believed the strip search phone call scam to be the work of one man because so many of the calls followed a similar pattern. Some of the strip searches weren't even reported to police because embarrassed restaurant officials were reluctant to publicize them. As the calls continued, they grew more abusive and perverse. Some companies began sending out memos warning their employees of the hoax. However, they were mainly sent to those who owned and operated the franchise rather than to those who actually worked in the store and answered the phones. Even when the appropriate information was shared, it was seemingly not taken seriously. According to the Louisville Courier Journal, one assistant manager read a memo about strip search phone calls approximately one month before performing a strip search on a waitress at an Applebee's in Davenport, Iowa for over an hour and a half. He later claimed that at the time of the phone call, he had quote-unquote forgotten about it. 
The McDonald's claims that they trained their employees to be aware of the strip search phone call scam. And their training manual included the statement, quote, no legitimate law enforcement agency would ever ask you to conduct such a search, end quote. Few workers interviewed recalled this part of the training. By 2004, McDonald's and at least one other company, Pizza Hut, were facing lawsuits related to the calls from victims. Victims' accusations were frequently dismissed by both police and the restaurant companies. Restaurant owners and police often said they assumed the caller and victims were, quote, in cahoots in a bizarre scam to extract settlements from individual franchises, end quote. The most notable incident of the scam took place on April 9, 2004, at a McDonald's in Mount Washington, Kentucky. 51-year-old assistant manager Donna Summers claimed that a man who identified himself as quote-unquote Officer Scott called the restaurant. The caller gave Summers a vague description of a petite young white woman who was suspected of stealing a purse. Summers believed the description provided was that of 18-year-old employee Luis Ogborn. Ogborn had been working at McDonald's for about four months at the time and was a model employee. She was a shy senior in high school who had taken the job to help support her family. The caller told Summers that Ogborn could be searched at the store or be arrested, taken to jail, and searched there. In a deposition, Ogborn said, quote, I was bawling my eyes out and literally begging them to take me to the police station because I didn't do anything wrong, end quote. Summers then brought Ogborn to the restaurant's small office and told her to empty her pockets and surrender her car keys and cell phone. At the request of the caller, Summers then asked her to remove her clothes one item at a time. Another assistant manager, 40-year-old Kimmy Dockery, was brought in to be a witness and said Ogborn was crying. The caller told Summers that he was also speaking to McDonald's corporate as well as the store manager, whom he mentioned by name, and Summers thought she could hear police radios in the background. Ogborn was given an apron to cover herself, and Summers did as she was told and placed Osborne's clothes in her car for police to pick up. Summers said, quote, when I asked him questions about why, he always had an answer, end quote. At the request of the caller, Summers did not tell Dockery what was going on and eventually asked her to leave after she attempted to comfort Osborne. Jason Bradley, a 27-year-old cook who Summers at one point called in to watch Osborne, refused to go along with the caller's instructions to remove her apron and describe her. However, neither Dockery nor Bradley called the police or demanded the search to be aborted. Ogborn had been kept in the office for an hour and felt as though she couldn't leave. Summers then told the caller she had to get back to the counter, and the caller asked if she had a husband who could watch Ogborn. She then called her 41-year-old fiancé, Walter West Nix Jr., to come in and help. Summers told him that Officer Scott had accused the girl of dealing drugs and that police at that very moment were searching her home in Taylorsville, Kentucky. Nix did as the caller instructed. He pulled the apron off Ogborn, leaving her nude again, and described her to the caller. He ordered her to dance with her arms above her head to see, the caller said, if anything would quote-unquote shake out. He made her do jumping jacks, deep knee bends, stand on a swivel chair, then a desk, and he made her sit on his lap and kiss him in order for Nix to smell anything that might be on her breath. Ogborn said she wanted to run, but that it would have been too humiliating to run through the restaurant naked. When she didn't address Nix as sir, he slapped her buttocks until they had red welts, just as the caller told him to do. When Summers would come back into the office, Nix did as the caller ordered and had Ogborn put on the apron before going back to the abuse when Summers left the office. The caller would occasionally talk directly to Ogborn, demanding she do as she was told if she wanted to keep her job and avoid further punishment. The caller said she should kneel on the brick floor in front of Nix and unbuckle his pants. In a deposition, Ogborn stated, quote, I said no, I didn't do anything wrong. This is ridiculous. 
end quote. Nix then told her he would hit her if she didn't fillet him, so she followed orders. At some point, the caller told Nix he could leave, but Summers needed to find another man to replace him. On his way home, Nix reportedly called a friend and told him he had done something terrible. After Nix left, Summers brought in Thomas Sims, a 58-year-old maintenance man who did odd jobs at the store. Sims would say in a deposition he was shocked by the sight of Ogborn trying to cover herself with a small piece of cloth. Summers insisted it was fine for him to watch her, that quote-unquote corporate had approved it. Sims, who had only come into the store to buy coffee and a dessert, spoke to the caller and refused to ask Ogborn to remove her apron and describe her body. Sims told Summers, quote, something is not right about this, end quote. This caused Summers to realize something was indeed wrong. She called the store manager, Lisa Siddons, who the caller had claimed he was speaking with. In reality, Siddons was at home sleeping. After realizing she had been duped, Summers said she had quote-unquote lost it, and the caller hung up. Someone then used star 69 to obtain the caller's phone number. Summers begged Ogborn for her forgiveness, and Ogborn reportedly asked Dockery, the assistant manager, if she had to come back into work the next day. The entire incident lasted over three hours and was recorded by CCTV. After watching the footage, Summers called off her engagement to Nix. Police were called to the scene. Summers was initially suspended, then later fired for violating a McDonald's rule barring non-employees from entering the office. Several weeks later, she was indicted on a charge of unlawful imprisonment, and Nix was indicted on charges of sodomy and assault. Dockery was transferred to another restaurant, and Ogborn never went back to work. Ogborn began suffering from panic attacks, severe insomnia, and nightmares about a man attacking her. She went on to graduate from high school, but was too shaken to enroll at the University of Louisville, where she had planned to study pre-med. Until the Mount Washington call, several police departments were able to trace the calls to phone booths in Panama City, Florida. Buddy Stump, the only detective at the Mount Washington Police Department, tracked down the phone number the call had been made from but it was listed as a non-existent phone number and turned out to have been made on a prepaid calling card. He also learned that the call had originated in Panama City, Florida. A Panama City detective told Stump that an officer from Massachusetts was also on the trail of the caller. Detective Sergeant Vic Flaherty had been assigned to lead a task force investigating the crimes after the caller hit four Wendy's in the Boston suburbs on one night in February 2004. Flaherty had traced a calling card used in some of the hoaxes to a Panama City Walmart, but the store surveillance footage only captured customers entering and exiting, not at the registers. Flaherty and Stump worked together and discovered that the card had been purchased just hours before the Mount Washington call. The camera at that store was trained on the registers, and it showed the purchaser was a white man, about 35 to 40, with slick back black hair and glasses. The same man could be seen on Flatterty's video entering the other Walmart in Panama City. In June 2004, Flatterty flew to Panama City. Through his work with local police, he was able to identify the man on the Walmart surveillance cameras as 38-year-old David R. Stort, a married father of five who worked as a guard at a correctional facility. Stewart began to, quote, sweat profusely and shake uncontrollably, end quote, when confronted and denied making the calls or purchasing the calling cards. When detectives searched his house, they found a calling card that had been used to call nine restaurants in the past year. They also found dozens of applications for police department jobs, hundreds of police magazines, police-type uniforms, guns, and holsters. Stewart was arrested later that month, and his family stood by him. He was extradited to Kentucky to be tried on charges of impersonating a police officer and solicitation of sodomy. He faced up to 15 years in prison. Police in Massachusetts were awaiting the results of the trial before proceeding with their case. Detectives in other jurisdictions say they didn't press charges because the caller's crime would be a misdemeanor for which he could not be extradited. Stewart's defense attorney argued that Stewart was not smart enough to pull off the scam. On October 31, 2006, Stewart was acquitted on all charges. 
His acquittal was likely due to a lack of direct evidence. Earlier that year, Summers entered an Alford guilty plea to a single count of unlawful imprisonment as a misdemeanor and was sentenced to one year of probation. Nix was indicted on charges of sodomy and assault. He pled guilty and was sentenced to five years in prison after working out a plea deal that included his testimony against Stewart. In 2007, Osborne filed a lawsuit against McDonald's alleging it failed to warn employees about the cause and did not protect her. Summers followed suit and filed her own claim against the company. The civil trial began in September of that year. McDonald's based its defense on four parts. That Summers deviated from the company's management manual, which prohibits strip searches, and therefore McDonald's should not be held responsible for any action of Summers outside the scope of her employment. Workers' compensation law prohibited employees from suing their employer. Nix, who actually performed the acts, was not a McDonald's employee, and the victim did not remove herself from the situation, contrary to common sense. McDonald's went on to sue Nix and Stewart. Although a McDonald's security executive has sent a 10 to 15 second voice message to every store in the region about hoax calls about a week before the Mount Washington incident, sit-ins, the restaurant manager said in her deposition it didn't mention strip searches. The McDonald's global security director also said the company also failed to execute a plan it had developed to send warning stickers to be placed on the headset and cradle of the phone in every store. Ogborn, who was then 21, went on to win the suit and was awarded $5 million in punitive damages and just over $1.1 million in compensatory damages. In settling the compensatory damages, the Bullock County Circuit Court judge placed half the blame for the incident on McDonald's and the other half on the unnamed caller. The jury also awarded $1.1 million to Summers, who also sued the fast food chain. Following Stewart's arrest, it is believed that the hoax call stopped. No one else has ever been arrested or charged for the strip search phone call scam. Del, what are your thoughts on this bizarre case? Yeah, this case is so bizarre and wild. And it's one of those things where you think you understand what's going on and then something else just hits you out of nowhere and it just gets crazier and crazier. I definitely understand where these restaurants are coming from, where they're just like, we need to do what we can to stop it. And outside of a message, there wasn't really anything that they could do. But it is a very embarrassing and traumatic experience for the victims. Not only are you going through a sexual assault, it's happening at your job, which then places additional trauma on you because that's your livelihood. That's how you support your family. Speaking of like the main case that we went over, the Ogborn case, it is so disgusting what the caller did and the fact that you had a random guy come into the store and go along with it is strange to me some part of me understands where summers was coming from and her fear and her uncertainty because she worked there she was answering the phone and the caller was likely really convincing but What would make her fiancé come to the store and participate in this makes no sense to me. I'm happy that someone finally stood up and pointed out how weird it was. But the fact that it took so many different people, I think it was like the fourth or fifth person to say something is absolutely ridiculous. It definitely seems like the right person was caught. They just didn't have enough evidence to actually convict him. But, you know, we're going to talk about this more. It's just like what goes into your brain as you are thinking that you're getting ready to do this? Like, why is this something that someone would get gratification from? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But we'll talk about that next. What are your thoughts on it? 
It's so upsetting and it really makes my blood boil. Stuart has to be the person that did this. If you ask me, no one else makes any sense. I mean, they couldn't even get close to anybody else. So the fact that he hasn't served jail time bothers me. I mean, the justice system worked in the sense that the jury didn't feel that they had great evidence supported, like given to them, which I respect, but I think we can all probably agree that he did it. I agree, Del. It's hard because you can kind of understand where Summers is coming from. I'm by no means defending someone, strip searching someone, but you can think maybe the police would ask you to do that. You know, like this was the 90s and early 2000s. People might not have really known their rights as much as we talk about it now. But in what world would a police officer have you bring in your fiance, like a random man, like you said, to come in? And in what world would a police officer have you smack someone's butt, have them dance, and then have them perform oral sex on you? That to me is like, I draw the line there. I don't understand it, how anyone could go along with that. I mean, You talk about this now and like red flag, red flag, red flag so many times and these people just kept going. So it's hard to understand, but we are going to talk about like the some psychology potentially behind this. I feel so bad for Ogborn. I can't imagine being 18 years old having to deal with that. And then her response was, do I have to come to work tomorrow? Like that shows just how young and vulnerable and like naive she was. And I cannot imagine. And then to hear her say like, she thought it would be too humiliating to just run out of the office naked. And then knowing what had to happen after that, really, it, my heart breaks for her. But I'm glad she stood up to McDonald's. And McDonald's trying to victim blame and really make it seem like they had nothing to do with this. Just ridiculous. It's like I said, this just makes my blood boil. There is a little bit of psychology behind this and just general obedience. A North Dakota judge who handled one of the phone call hoaxes that involved the manager of a Burger King being sentenced to 30 days in jail for disorderly conduct for slapping the buttocks of a seven-year-old employee said, quote, it's not just conceivable to me that there's any reasonable justification for what happened, end quote. Psychological experts say it is human nature to obey orders from an authority figure, no matter how evil they might seem. This has been proven time and time again in many different psychological experiments. Seeking to understand why so many Germans follow orders during the Holocaust, Stanley Milgram, a Yale University psychologist, took out a classified ad in 1961 inviting residents of New Haven, Connecticut to take part in what they was told was a study of the relationship between punishment and learning. A man in a white lab coat introduced the participants to a student and told them to shock the student each time he made a mistake, increasing the voltage with each error. In reality, the machine was a prompt and the student was an actor who wasn't shocked. Nearly two-thirds of Milgram subject gave what they believed were paralyzing jolts to a pitiful protesting victim simply because an authority figure the man in the white coat had commanded them to do so. Quote, with numbling regularity, good people were seen to knuckle under the demands of authority and perform actions that were callous and severe. End quote. Milgram wrote of his results, which were later replicated in nine countries. Of the strip search scam, Dr. Thomas Blass, Milgram's protege, said, quote, Once you accept another person's authority, you become a different person. You are concerned with how well you follow out your orders rather than whether it is right or wrong, end quote. According to Simply Psychology, quote, In order to obey authority, the obeying person has to accept it as legitimate or rightful, legal, for the command to be made of them, end quote. Obedience involved a hierarchy of power and status. Therefore, the person given the order has a higher status than the person receiving an order. Blind obedience to those in charge can have unfortunate consequences when leaders lack ethical convictions themselves. 
In everyday situations, people obey orders because they want to get rewards, because they want to avoid the negative consequences of disobeying, and because they believe an authority figure is legitimate. In more extreme situations, people obey even when they are required to violate their own values or commit crimes. People obey easy commands first and then feel compelled to obey more and more difficult commands. This process is called entrapment, and it illustrates the the foot-in-the-door phenomenon. Fast food restaurants were likely targeted in this scam because the workers tend to be young and inexperienced, and assistant managers were likely to be working without supervision. Retired FBI Special Agent Dan Jablonski, a Wichita, Kansas private detective who investigated hoaxes for Wendy's franchises in the Midwest, said, quote, You and I can sit here and judge these people and say they were blooming idiots, but they aren't trained to use common sense. They are trained to say and think, can I help you? End quote. In her book, Making Fast Food from the Frying Pan into the Fryer, Canadian sociologist Esther Ryder concludes that the most prized trait in fast food workers is obedience. Quick serve restaurants, as they are known in the industry, also may be vulnerable because managers are trained to cooperate with law enforcement, said Jean James, the president of the National Food Service Security. Describing her situation, Ogborn said, quote, I was scared because they were a higher authority to me. I was scared for my own safety because I thought I was in trouble with the law, end quote. During a deposition, Ogborn's therapist said she followed orders because her experience with adults, quote, has been to do what she is told because good girls do what they are told, end quote. And Ogborn also said she trusted her manager to do what was right. Clinical psychologist Jeff Gardier says the caller's actions were likely a way to feed a godlike complex by manipulating his victims emotionally, physically, and sexually. He calls it, quote unquote, virtual voyeurism. Del, any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm definitely not surprised. I think that as a society, we're raised to be obedient and we're raised to make sure that we have unquestioned respect for those of a higher authority or social status than us. And I think that we're also raised to place our trust in, you know, cops and other figures like that. So it definitely makes sense that If you're using a false law enforcement persona, you're going to be able to get people to agree to do things that they likely wouldn't do if it was a peer that had told them to do it. The Milgram experience is definitely an interesting one, and it's been replicated in different ways. And so many different psychological experiments, like we said, have shown that once you give someone authority or show someone authority, even if they know it's a part of the experiment and it's false, people are going to fall in line. I think of like the Stanford prison experiment and how quickly those students fell in line with either being the authority figure or listening to it. When it comes to fast food restaurants being the most likely target, that also makes sense to me because like we said, they are young, they typically don't have a lot of life experience, and they likely have never been in a situation or know anyone else in a situation, like being scammed or people pretending to be police. They don't know what to look for necessarily. And if they don't receive the training from their job, it's something that will continue to happen. And like actually quality training, not it being spoke about for five seconds during a training of a thousand other things. It's definitely something that needs to be reinforced by the restaurant so that they're able to protect their workers. But we know that a lot of these corporations really don't care and just want their workers to come in and be robots, which is, you know, why you end up with things like the scam and you end up with McDonald's paying almost $7 million because they didn't take the time to take this hoax seriously. What are your thoughts on it? I definitely agree about it's unfortunately not surprising Even though it's shocking, it's not really surprising that people do follow orders from authority. And it's interesting that, like you said, the Milgram experiment has been done many times in many different ways. And people still do 
I don't want to say fall for it, but people still take part exactly the way you think they would from past results. I found it really interesting to hear people say why specifically fast food restaurants were targeted. I wouldn't have really like thought to like think about it more, but everything they said definitely makes sense. And I understand why these places were targeted, especially like we were saying, everyone tends to be kind of young there maybe not a ton of life experience, people that are more likely to obey authority. And like we said too, it seemed like the caller targeted more rural areas where people may also be more trusting of authority. He um, really did a lot of planning when looking into this. And the virtual voyeurism accusation is pretty interesting too. And I would definitely agree with why this person did what they did. Seemed maybe like a lack of control in their life probably caused this to happen. Though the fast food strip search phone scam was unique, phone scams are common. Telephone scammers try to steal your money or personal information. Scams may come through phone calls from real people, robocalls, or text messages. Callers often make false promises such as opportunities to buy products, invest your money, or receive free product trials. They may also offer you money through free grants and lotteries. Some scammers may call with threats of jail or lawsuits if you don't pay them. Some examples include the imposter scams, which is when a scammer pretends to be someone you trust, like a government agency like the Social Security Administration or the IRS, a family member, a love interest, or someone claiming there's a problem with your computer. The scammer can even have a fake name or number show up on your caller ID to convince you, which is known as spoofing. Prize and lottery scams. In a typical prize scam, the caller will say you've won a prize, but then say you need to pay taxes, registration fees, or shipping charges to get it. But after you pay, you find out that there is no prize. The final one is bank fraud calls. Scammers will call and say they're alerting a customer to potential fraud in their bank account. As the call progresses, they request bank account numbers, passwords, or other sensitive data. Remember these tips to avoid being a victim of a telephone scam. Do register your number with the National Do Not Call Registry. You may register online or by calling one 888 382-1222. And of course, that's within the United States. If you still receive telemarketing calls after registering, there is a good chance that the calls are scams. Be wary of callers claiming that you've won a prize or vacation packages. Hang up on suspicious phone calls. Be cautious of caller ID. Scammers can change the phone number that shows up on your caller ID screen. This is called spoofing, like we said independently research business opportunities, charities, or travel packages that the caller offers. Don't give into pressure to take immediate action. Don't say anything if a caller starts the call asking, can you hear me? This is a common tactic for scanners to record you saying yes. Scammers record your yes response and use it as proof that you agreed to a purchase or credit card charge. Don't provide your credit card number, bank account information, or other personal information to a caller. Don't send money if a caller tells you to wire money or pay with a prepaid debit card. And if you've lost money to a phone scam or have information about the company or scammer who called you, you can report it at reportfraud.ftc.gov. And again, within the United States. If you didn't lose money and just want to report a call, you can use the streamlined reporting form at do not call.gov. So do you have any thoughts on this or have you experienced any kind of phone scams before? I haven't experienced any, but definitely because of all the warning signs that have been placed in, I would say like the last five or so years, I'm definitely someone who hesitant to answer my phone if I don't already know like who's calling or if I'm not expecting a call, it's definitely something where I'm like super cautious because you never know what the attention of someone who's calling. I think because of that, when I'm doing like personal calls, 
like answering them. I'm very quick to like not say anything, but like, who are you? Where are you calling from? Like, that's the first thing. A lot of times I don't even let them get through their introduction because I want to make sure that it's a legitimate person. And I think overall, learning about different scams have kind of helped me really navigate the not just phone scams, but online scams in general and making sure that I am protecting myself from them. I definitely think it's important for people to have their phone number registered and make sure that they're staying up to date on the latest guidance to avoid being scammed. People are definitely going to continue to be nefarious and continue to try to take what's not theirs. And so it's unfortunate that we have to do it, but people have to make sure that they are uh, protecting themselves and protecting their personal information and their money. What about you? Yeah, I have not been the victim of a scam, a phone scam or anything like that. I feel like sometimes they tend to be pretty obvious, but like we've been saying, scammers adapt to times and trends and technology. So it is very important to educate yourself. And I would always say like, just err on the side of caution. I know I'm on like the do not call list. It doesn't always work, but if I'm constantly being called by like an outside area code or like some, the number, the phone number with like one or two numbers off, like I just immediately block and report it as spam. You got to do what you got to do because there are so many ways to be duped and to be tricked into stuff, especially with like bank account information. I feel like there's always like new trends with bank account scams and protect yourself however you can, because it's, can be really difficult to get back your money and your information. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the strip search phone scam. You can read more about this case and how to support it in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.